Finance 2020-21 Budget Authorization to Publish Notice of Hearing. The proposed 2020-21 district budget will be shared with the board at today's meeting. The 2021 notice of hearing will be provided at the board table, which is in your packets. It is recommended the board approve the publication of the 2021 notice of hearing that will set the annual budget hearing for August 24th, 2020. Welcome, Susan Willis. It's good to see you again. It doesn't seem possible that we're voting on a budget, but this is just crazy times right now. <laughs> we've, we've made it to at least this milestone. There you anyway, go. So. Nothing stops. <laughs> yep. Keep going. Well, good afternoon, President Logan, Superintendent Thompson, members of the board. Thank you. Um, as our president said, this is our um, milestone moment as far as this is our presentation of our full budget report and our notice of hearing for the 2021 um, budget. So we'll start today, um, similar to how we, we started last, um, the last time I spoke to you, and that was uh, kind of to put some terminology in front of the board and in front of our public, because there are a lot of different ways that we look at budget numbers. And one of the primary roles that the Board of Education has is to adopt a legal maximum budget. So it's called, commonly called the legal max. Um, it establishes kind of the upper end of budget authority that we cannot exceed as we go through the next school year. So there is, um, there is a lot of differences when you look at that code 99 that's in front of you. That's what gets published in the paper. Those three columns that are in that report, there's two actual expenditure columns, and then the third column is our legal max budget authority. So when you compare those, they should be less. If they're not less, then I probably shouldn't be sitting here. I shouldn't have a job because we've then overextended ourselves <laughs> somewhere. So we should always spend less than we budget because we only get so much money and we can't exceed the amount of funding we receive. So as we look at those actuals versus budget, you will see a pretty large discrepancy and there should be some years are going to be a larger um, discrepancy or a larger shortage than others. And if you look at what happened to us last year, um, and we're going to go through this in a minute, but we, we had the, the final quarter of the school year was, was basically shut down. We should have had some reduction in expenditures. Therefore, when you look at our net expenditures for 2020, those numbers are lower than anticipated, and that makes sense. So anyway, we want to kind of cover those those the actual expenditures versus budgeted expenditures versus budgeted authority, your job today is to approve that maximum budget authority that we will establish for next year. So just some budget highlights and assumptions that were used to build the budget. The base state aid per pupil did increase from $44.36 per student to $4,569 per student. Um, that funded base aid FTE decreased, though, as far as the number of, of FTE students that we get a count on that base, decreased 182.9 FTE. And that is using fiscal year 19's enrollment. So we have to look two years back to get our highest number. Um, we do, and we did build the budget based on an anticipating weighting decrease of between 1 and 2% but we have built in some contingencies on that weighting to account for some count variations. Since this is a very unique year for us, we don't know exactly where our weightings are going to land, so we have built in some contingencies in those to account for ups and downs in those weighting funds. Um, the budget is also based on a 4.5% um, assessed valuation growth. That was the um, assessed valuation growth that, that we um, experienced for, for 19-20. And then we have built the budget based on a maximum LOB authority of 33% of the general fund. So we'll start with the mill levies. Um, the overall decrease didn't change from when we presented in July. We had a little variation between the LOB and the bond, just a little adjustment there. But essentially our general fund mill will be at 20 mills. That's statutorily set. We don't have the ability to modify that. Our supplemental general mill will be at 17.045 mills. That is with us moving to the maximum um, authority of 33% of the general fund. We're doing this to obtain maximum budget flexibility as we go into this school year with a, a significant amount of unknowns coming at us. 
Um, the capital outlay uh, basically remains at eight mills. That's again, maximum authority. We can't exceed eight mills in the, in the capital outlay fund based on our needs in capital. Um, bond and interest, we are decreasing to 7.828 as we forecasted our long-term needs in bond and interest, and we feel this is an adequate mill levy to get us through um, for the, the, the foreseeable future. Um, we also brought down the special liability just a little bit, again, based on need in that particular fund to account and cover um, torts and those type of expenditures that the district experiences. So again, our total mill levy for the 2021 budget year will be 52.973 mills. That's a decrease of 0.21 mills going into next year. Showing you the long-term trend in our mill levy history going back to the 09-10 school year, you can see that we have purposely tried to keep it relatively stable. Um, we've had a, a few ups and downs. Typically, that's related to equity issues in the school finance formula. Um, we have been on a, on a slight, slight downtrend um, these past few years as more uh, LOB state aid has come into the formula. So um, I think we're, we feel pretty good that we have maintained this even through um, some challenging years um, in school finance. So 52.973 mills. So here's our kind of our look back. This is the numbers you're seeing on that code 99. We, uh, in the, for fiscal year 20, we adopted a budget of $761 million. Our actual expenditures for fiscal year 20 were $709 million. Um, and again, that kind of demonstrates that difference between budget authority, the max the district could spend in any given year, and where actuals come in. Um, a lot of that is kind of built around capital outlay. We budget in capital to give ourselves some maneuvering room, but we really don't want to spend it all. That, that we need it for these outlying years and to catch up on deferred maintenance but we have these last few years been trying to build more budget authority into capital outlay. You'll see here in just a few minutes, I've built even more into this year, knowing that we are going to have some unforeseen expenditures and even some known expenditures that are going to have to go into capital because there won't be money elsewhere to cover. So what we did just to kind of compare apples to apples is we did actually put you um, a, uh, a screenshot of looking at last year's actual adopted budget to our proposed budget for this year. So again, $761 million for fiscal year 20. For fiscal year 21, we are proposing a budget of $809 million. That's an increase in budget authority of almost $48 million. So how does that break down? I'm just going to kind of cover the, the kind of the bigger fund highlights. In the general fund, that's before we make any transfers, remembering that all weighted funds go through the general fund. So pre-K, at-risk, um, at-risk dollars, everything flows through the general fund, and then from the general fund, it transfers out. And typically, we're transferring out more than what we get in that particular weighting. So for example, we might get $4 million in pre-K, at-risk funding, but we transfer out $7 million because we need $7 million of pre-K expenditures to cover that program. And that's typical for all our, pro all our programs, such as at-risk, CTE, um, bilingual. Typically, we don't get enough in waiting, so the general fund supports those initiatives. Um, so right now, our increase in budget authority in the general fund is slated at 13, almost $13.4 million. So that will also include our special ed transfers, um, and that, 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 that contingency on those counts are kind of embedded in that $13.4 million, and then the new state aid. So again, that's an, kind of a slightly higher number than we actually anticipate getting, but that covers us for count variations. It covers us for that final special ed adjustment that we don't actually receive until next May. So a lot of different things go into this general fund maximum budget authority calculation. Um, but we're, we're feeling that's, that $13.4 million is a, is a good max budget authority as we go into fiscal year 21. We showed this to you last, um, last time, but this is what we're proposing for the supplemental general fund. We are proposing moving from 116 million, uh, almost 117 million last year in maximum budget authority to 130 million 
$130.5 million in maximum budget authority in the um, supplemental general fund, which is 33% of the general fund. We're exercising full authority. We can't go any higher than 33%. And that will drive about $13.8 million into the budget. Um, now, we may not get the full, have the full $130 million when the budget actually kind of finalizes next June, because if the general fund counts, those weightings actually do come in lower as we anticipate, that impacts the supplemental general fund, 33% of a smaller number. So it, we may not get the full 13.8, but regardless, we want to maximize the authority to make sure that we have enough coverage for those expenditures which we outlined for you last time, already exceed what we're getting in some of our federal aid packages. Um, so again, the more, the more federal aid that comes in, the less we have to tap into some of these other, other um, budget um, opportunities. So just to kind of show you a few more funds that we're, where this kind of this $47 million budget increase is coming from, a large part of it's coming out of capital outlay. We are proposing, um, a $14 million budget authority increase in capital outlay, so that will take it from last year's almost $50 million to uh, almost $64 million. And you approved the, the uh, internet piece just um, today. That's an example of the items that we may need to push through to capital in order to meet the needs of our students and our staff um, during this very unusual um, pandemic response year um, coming at us. Um, virtual fund, again, with the increase in enrollment in virtual, you would anticipate some budget changes here, and we are proposing a million dollars more into virtual. Um, the bond and interest payments are up, will be up this year for almost $2 million, and, and the, the fund can adequately cover that at $42.7 million. Nutrition services, is we're actually right now budgeting a decrease. Um, that is based on the potential loss in funding that we anticipate coming in related to the differences in serving meals as we go through the My School Remote, um, the on-site, and virtual programming. So um, this is a fund we're going to have to watch very carefully through the course of the year. It is a fund that um, we may need to support with federal package relief if we get some additional dollars there. Um, it's, it's, it's just going to be impacted by the change in dynamic of what school looks like going into, um, going into September. Federal funds are up $9 million. There's the CARES Act, or what's remaining of the CARES Act going into fiscal year 21. It's not the $13 million, because we've already spent a big chunk of it at the end of the fiscal year as we put a purchase order out there for the $24 million in technology. The first purchase order went actually before the end of the fiscal year. So that, that is part of what's remaining. And then special education as a fund is up about $4.5 million. This is primarily um, related to the um, transportation increase, um, six million and a half for um, our vendor increase on that contract. Half of that is sped. So we, that's a good chunk of what's going into special ed and then just normal um, compensation type of increases in that particular fund. I think the key takeaway related to the particular budget um, uh, that we are proposing is that the uh, 87% uh, that's focused on the direct support of student remains unchanged. This is the same breakdown. It's shifted a little bit. Nutrition services a little bit less. Transportation's a little bit more. But 87% of our operating budget is focused on the classroom. So that, that has, that's always kind of in the forefront of our minds as we develop our budget, is how do we ensure that our dollars are making it into support of the classroom. So we take this wheel very seriously and as we're building the budget, we, we, we analyze those percentages to make sure that that budget supports the key mission and, and, and the, and the uh, strategic plan of the district. And so having that money directed into the classroom is critical. So we will have um, a, a, a completed draft of the budget basically out online that um, our stakeholders can go review. That will include um, the Code 99 that will be published in the area newspapers on Wednesday, so anyone can review and certainly can um, uh, submit questions. The public hearing would be set then for August 24th, uh, and that's when we would adopt the budget. And so what we are asking the board this afternoon is that we are recommending that the board establish 6 p.m. on August 24th, 2020 as the public hearing and budget adoption for the 2020-21 budget.
And that, that, with that, I will answer any questions the board might have. Uh, Mike Rohde. Well, it's nice to see that we're finally getting to the 2000 and what, five level? We, we are actually. Yeah, we're, we're, we're gaining every year we're gaining, we're, hallelujah. A um, Couple of clarifications, I wanna make sure that some people don't remember some of the things year to year. Our LOB goes to the state after we collect it and send it to the state and then they send us back a portion. And we it, get a, we, and I can't remember what that percentage is. Are, are we talking about the, the general fund, you mean the mm -hmm. 20 mills? Yes. So yes, the, the, uh, the 20 mills we collect locally, that all, all, every school district sends this, their 20 mills to the state. And then we actually get that back in the form of state aid based on that 45, 69 per student. Um, I haven't actually calculated that to see what that's going to be for 21. Um, and right off the top of my head, I can't recall what it is as far as what it was last year. So I can get back to you with that information. That's, I just but wanna make yes. sure the people are realizing that we're losing some of our own LOB to the state and they're using it as state they, aid. They count it as, as, as part of our aid, but it is, it is local tax driven, so yes. Right, and the, it's a, it's a number that I can't even fathom anymore because when I came on the board, it wasn't even close to this, but the $809 million that we're budgeting this year, the one thing you didn't talk about was capers. What's the capers number this year? Um, the, we're budgeting capers at 60, the, the flow through of capers, that's $60 yes. million. Dollars. Okay, and that's important for people to know because that's money that we get part of our budget, but we don't get to spend it. It's, it's the funding that basically the state flows through, it stays in our account for about 30 seconds and it flows right back out. Right, and that's one of those things, the state looks good and, and we don't under, people don't understand why we can't spend that money. It, so. Yeah, it, it drives the cost per pupil up uh, as far as that $60 million is part of the overall budget, but we don't have control over how we spend that. It basically comes in, goes right back out. There, and we have, there's a number of funds, obviously, that are restricted. We're still um, a, you know, primarily a restricted fund district as far as two-thirds of our budget has some sort of target or restriction on it. There's really only a third of our budget that has flexible usage. Well, thank you for all your hard work. I do appreciate it. Well, kudos to the, 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 the financial services teams. They did a phenomenal job um, for the last few months to, to put all this together and in the middle of an upgrade. So. Yeah, they're doing great. And, and I want to just have her wave her hand up there, um, Miss Addie. I just think it's important to recognize her. She's amazing. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, the um, in the federal funds that we've gotten for COVID, uh, you have here in the budget, and there is talk about. At Washington adding some funding for school districts it's not passed yet but where do we stand with that uh, how would we if we get that huge if if we get that where would we add that into this budget authority so federal funds we include that in the budget but we it's we don't have to there, there's no maximum budget authority like there are in the other funds so if we do get another federal package it's actually a pull down reimbursement process so if we decided with, if we had a HEROES Act or a HEALS Act or whatever the version we're going to potentially get at some point, if we actually do get it, um, it would set up, it would either come to us through the state in the form of some sort of grant. Typically that's how those federal funds work is the KSDE then would actually allocate that probably based on a Title I allocation process. That's how the CARES money worked. And so then we come up with what we need, our spending plan, and then as we spend those dollars, we're able to draw down that additional dollars. But it, it, it doesn't have to be reflected per se in here at this point. So we don't have to add that in for our N no. proposed budget. And if, if, we, if we did have any issues, we could always come back and, and republish. But I don't believe and I'll look, that we don't have to republish okay. for federal funds. Okay, good, and thank you. And Cheryl, I wanna also stay here for a moment. Can you also talk about those dollars as it relates to um, our other school systems or you know, organizations that we also have to support with those dollars? 
Sure. We talked a little bit about this in July, the fact that when, when we get federal packages like this, there is a non-public portion that basically passes through us and we distribute to the schools. And it's similar that we don't actually send the money. We actually have to coordinate the services. So if they need, um, they need technology, then we coordinate the purchasing of that technology and write the check to the vendor and then the technology gets shipped to the school, um, the non-public school. So there's just a tremendous amount of work related to the, the um, process of getting dollars into those non-public schools because we're responsible. We have to ensure that they follow the same guidelines that we have to follow. So it's, it's, there is just a lot, of, um, there's a lot of accountability related to those dollars on us. Now we are able to um, have, there is a, uh, an indirect charge that we can apply to federal funds for the labor, but typically because there's just not enough work for a person, that falls to staff to basically absorb those roles in their regular days. So it's, it's just a bit of work. And I just wanna be clear, so when we get a federal package, we don't get to spend that exact amount. So for instance, if you get $17 million, we don't get to spend $17 million because I believe this last time, we had to give 25% of that, we had to give to non-pub. So just making it clear to our community also that, uh, because I've heard some folks say, well, you got, well, we didn't get, we actually, we had to share. And it's okay to, to share, but just recognize that some of the dollars that we did receive, we were not able to spend them because we had to share it. And in this, in, particularly in the form of CARES, that information was released very late as far as the process for the non-public schools. Typically, like with Title I, we're getting that non-public allocation at the same time as we get our allocation. So we can start to make our plans. We know what our piece is. We can support their piece. It took, it took the decision makers a very long time to decide how CARES was going to work related to non-public institutions. So again, we were planning at around 16, 17 million dollars and then now we're having to backtrack a little bit and say, well, it's probably more like 13 to 14. That, that caused us you know, quite a bit of um, challenge when we had a plan based on 17, and now we have to back that off. So some needs at, under at least that particular plan would go unmet unless we're now going into these other parts of the budget. Okay, and I assume that the Wichita Public Schools District the schools that reside in the Wichita Public Schools districts are the ones we share with. We don't share with the whole Sedgwick County because not everybody's in our district in Sedgwick County. It, it's city of Wichita. So it's the whole city of Wichita, even if they aren't in our boundaries. Correct. Because we have, yes, uh, we it, have school My understanding that, is it's, it's, in the, it's the city of Wichita. So an Andover I, or a Mays wouldn't be doing the same thing. Shouldn't be, but the, I will tell you that the rules are not actually all nailed down yet. So, and we actually haven't seen the final allocation process, partly because we actually have to go pull some of that data and send it to the state before they'll validate. So it's a little bit of a moving target at this point. Okay, I do have one more question. And that is, you mentioned that our budget goes online and you gave the address here. When will that be available to the, pr to the public? Uh, it should go on Wednesday, I believe, Wednesday. So it's published on, on the, Wednesday with the notice, and it goes with the notice of hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Ben? Um, yes, Ben Blankley, District 1. Um, so uh, state aid waiting for virtual students. Um, I know I've seen a couple members of the public get confused on whether the district receives more or less state aid for an official virtual student. So virtual waiting is an interesting um, calculation. Uh, it is a current year calculation, so we don't look back at the prior two years like we do with, with the regular base aid. It is current year waiting, and right now you have to be a full-time student. You can't even be an hour short. You must be a full-time student. For that full-time student FTE, we would get $5,000. For a part-time FTE, so if you're an hour short, we only receive 1700 so there's not, it, it's a pretty good discrepancy between a full-time virtual and some sort of part-time. Even if you're a .9 virtual, you will, we only receive the 1700 in waiting. Um, virtual students do not receive at-risk dollars because they're not eligible for the free and reduced meals. So there is um, some loss for kids that perhaps were in our, with, were in schools traditionally and have chosen to go to virtual if they were 
receiving free lunch, we aren't going to receive potentially the aid and the at-risk aid on that. Now, that's just one of those, that's just the way the formula works. Could um, you tell them the difference between that? Because that was pretty significant for us. So if a student is a virtual student and they are an at-risk student and we may get the 5,000, but could you talk to them a little sure. bit about what that looks sure. like? Sure, we receive for at-risk waiting, um, a point, it's 0.484 um, percent of the, the, the base aid. So 2200 2300 for at-risk student um, per FTE. So when you, when your students, we, so we're getting $431 more than the base aid, but we potentially lose 22 or 2300 in at-risk waiting because they're not eligible. So it is kind of that fine balance when, when we were looking at what can the virtual fund manage, how many of those students would be pure, pure virtual and we don't lose the waiting because again, what are we using our at-risk dollars for? Um, Evidence-based programming that primarily pay for teachers. So it's very difficult to say, well, we'll just cut over here because we need it over here. Well, first of all, those dollars don't equal and a lot of those programs benefit a whole lot of other students. So it's, that's a, virtual is just tricky as far as a funding mechanism because the, it doesn't match. It's not a dollar for dollar. So you don't, don't put a dollar over here and lose a dollar over here. You might gain you know, 40 cents over here, but you lose $3 over here. So it's, and again, it's not every student, um, but it's very difficult to determine what that could be because you're not asking those questions at the time of enrollment. Um, so, uh, so our virtual students that are supported with this fund, would that only be the students in EI Academy? It, it, ha it is the students in the formal virtual um, program, which is our EI Academy for 2021 school year. So it's not my school remote. Those are um, kind of the same brick and mortar funding as the students who will actually attend at the locations. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, another question I have is is kind of a a general question about the public hearing. Um, since we're in the COVID modified meeting format where the public is viewing but not here and interacting, um, and this will be the first time we have an official budget hearing during this meeting format, is there any special things that we need to do in regards to that? I'm gonna turn that over to Mr. Mike. We are actually planning for the budget public hearing to have the podium open and people will be able to register to speak and uh, they will line up out in the hallway, come to the podium in the lecture hall, and then when they're done speaking, they will leave. We Thank just you. thought that it was important when you have this type of a budget to allow opportunities for anyone who would like to speak upon it to do so. And we understand that we have this situation with COVID-19, but again, we believe and we are modeling transparency and ability to engage with our community and we thought it was important to do so for this budget because it was such, it's such a big deal for us. Okay, thank you, that's all I have. Stan. Uh, Stan, Research District 4. <clears throat> Susan, I was uh, w watching the replay of our last meeting I think it was because I wanted to see uh, Ben do a shout out to Elmo. So I, <laughs> I thought I'd heard it, but I wanted to make sure I actually did. Um, but we'd had, we had one awkward sentence in that uh, meeting that said, and it ended, we're $10 million in the hole. And I thought that maybe created some confusion. So I wanted to clarify that from last meeting when we said that last time, we were talking $10 million behind on our COVID response and what we needed to do in that area. Is that correct? That's correct, okay. yes. The budget is balanced. Okay. Uh, and, that, and, and yeah, we are, in, we, uh, we, are, we, are not per, we are not budgeting in the negative. Okay. But there will be, obviously, those pockets, nutrition services being right. a good example, where that fund will potentially need some assistance because it will not probably drive the revenues it typically does related to the expenditures yeah. it, it will have to, to expend in order to meet the needs of our students. So we might need to go into another um, area if federal aid is one option, um, contingency would be another uh, to support those needs. So yes, that probably was a poor choice of words but it was, it, the, the, 
budget itself is balanced, but the list of COVID needs that we are going to be able to meet, we can't do it based on the current budget allocations. Some of those needs, that, which is why it's so important for us to prioritize what has to be done in order to get students safely to school and, and our staff to safe, those are 100% high priority, they come first. So we meet those needs and then we start down kind of the other list of normal operational things that might have to sit on the sidelines waiting for a particular package or we see how, how we get through the course of the year and are we spending certain certain areas, are we not spending in other areas, can we do some shifts in the budget to start to meet some of those other not as critical operational areas so that we can make sure our COVID response is tight, strong, and we fully have staff and students protected. Stan Reeser, District 4. Uh, yes, it was nobody's fault. It just, there was somebody speaking and at the very end that said, we're $10 million in the hole, and then we moved on to another subject. Right. And I was like, uh, that may have caused some confusion. <laughs> and state law, we can't, we can't, Correct. We can't deficit spend, right? right? That's correct. And, and I don't, there's not a, one of us up here that would want to do that anyway, right. even if we had that authority. Um, my second question is, if you had to break this down for the public, uh, what is the dollar amount that is new money, and would you define what new money is at this maximum level? So we had maximum been, authority, right? We had been we'd been presenting um, for the most part all through the spring that we anticipated based on the student count, the FTE count, and the increase in the base aid that we were anticipating around nine to nine and a half million dollars of kind of new base aid. Now we've uh, supported that with more LOB dollars because we're building a budget based on the thirty three percent, and that's thirteen million dollars. If we hadn't gone up, that would have you know, been a, you know, a million or so um, of additional LLB authority, maybe two. So we're probably at looking at around, as far as new money in the budget. Excluding federal ex dollars. Right, excluding all of those, around $22 million. Now, a, a good chunk of that, as we showed you in July, went to transportation, other fixed costs and what we've had to respond already in technology and a few of those other areas. So realistically, a lot of that money is already allocated and moving through the budget. So, um, but that, I think, does that answer yeah, your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Stan Research District 4. And new money is basically just the additional dollars we have this year. Right, right. It was, it was dollars due to the increase in base aid which was a 3% increase. Now we didn't receive a full 3% because of the FTE change. So it, we came in at two and change. Okay, and then my last question, I think it was late May or June, we spoke, uh, we, we had a whole presentation about reserves. Yes. And I realized that um, projecting out ahead of time is almost impossible at this time because number one, we don't know what the Kansas legislature is gonna do in uh, January when they reconvene and look at their tax revenues. By the way, how did July receipts come in? Uh, July, w w July revenues beat the estimates, so so far. They beat the revised. But the July's also, revised right, the estimate. revised estimates. But that also is a little bit challenging only because that we had yeah. that d deferral of the tax um, return date, so how much of that was actually oh, yeah. tax dollars coming in although I think a lot of those taxpayers actually filed extensions. So okay. again, m maybe not as meaningful, but I think overall, the consensus revenue estimates, the revised ones may have been a little bit aggressive. I think we'll see more in these coming months if that holds true. Um, and so we will be watching that as well. So did our reserves end where we thought they were going to and what are we projecting so our contingency, uh, we reported that we ended the fiscal year with $26 million in contingency. So that... And what's the percentage is that? Because we spoke a lot about percentages at that meeting. Well, we, I think where we, um, if I'm understanding your question, we had been sitting at four, and I'm going to put this in terms of days, actually, as opposed to percentages, because we typically tell... Um, our stakeholders that when we had 14 and change in contingency, that was about six operating days. 
So at $26 million, we're going to be closer to 12 to 13 operating days. So we've improved our position. Uh, we now at least can cover um, a teacher payroll. That was kind of a big goal for us is to make sure that if anything <laughs> yes. happened, we could actually cover a teacher payroll. Um, now, as far as if we have to dip into that particular fund, if that's what you're asking, if we're forecasting ahead, I, I, see, th I see a need potentially if we do not get additional federal packages that we will probably have no choice but to look at that fund to support COVID response whether it's with nutrition services or some other place. Um, I don't know exactly what other needs might come up. It's good that we have the option to go to that particular fund. Um, I'm hoping we can minimize the um, use of it because again, what we know is in front of us is, is we have to meet those needs, but we're also looking ahead. What is fiscal year 22 going to look like? Are we going to be in a worst case scenario if the state funds are in jeopardy? What's going to happen a year, two years out? So the more we can try to protect the bulk of that for 22, 23, whatever might be coming beyond just what's right in front of us right now, that's important for us to keep in our mind. That's contingency is, is our only unplanned savings account for whatever might come at us and we knew with an 800 million dollar budget 14 million dollars in contingency was not was a, 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 again a very very low percentage overall that 26 million dollars puts us at around i think this is probably where you were going at around 11 percent 11 to 12 percent based on the state's calculation of where dollars should kind of land so we're still well under kind of the state averages of 14 to to 16 percent across the state so I, I feel we made good progress um, I would I could sleep better at night if we were closer to 50 million in contingency but that's probably not realistic um, knowing what's kind of coming down the, the next two or three years for us so but really being very uh, intentional and purposeful when we go to look at the usages of those funds uh, is going to be very important Stan Research District for my last question and today what we're doing is doing the maximum authority. So other than contractual obligations, um, as we go throughout the year, I mean, we could reduce the budget, correct? I mean, this is the maximum amount we could spend, but that does not prevent us if we can be, if we find ways to be thrifty in area, other areas, correct? Correct, absolutely. Okay. And, and, we, and we do that every year, we, as we go through, we set that maximum um, budget authority and, and staff exactly do what you're saying is they look for better purchasing power, areas where if we don't spend over here, then we can use those dollars over here um, because there are those cases where you you do have your best plan, but then the plan doesn't come through the way you anticipate, and perhaps it was this particular project was twenty thousand dollars over. Well, we saved twenty thousand dollars over here, so we have we're okay. We don't have to do any sort of moving budget around, um, and especially when you're in a fund. Now, when we get fund to fund, then we have to kind of look at the budget authority in a particular fund to make sure we don't go over. But yes, that that is kind of the mission of your financial groups to look for those areas of savings to allow for other areas in the budget that may go over in a particular year. Stan Research District 4. I think the board understood that. I just wanted to make sure, sure. that got out to the public as well. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for the te whole team. I mean, you guys have done a really great job this year and under difficult situations. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I don't have a budget question per se, but a related question, I think, for Super, Superintendent Thompson, and that question is, how is our enrollment going and our free and reduced food applications, just those things that are going to be important uh, for our funding source? Well, at this point, we don't know yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we, we typically will do a report on our budget. Um, around the, what day do we usually do that? Around our September 20th number, that's when we will have official numbers on our enrollment. Okay, so we don't have, I mean, you don't have any we clue about what We typically don't, don't have those numbers until we get to September 20th. Okay, but the enrollment process is going well. Families enrollment are process is going, enrolled. and we again will continue to encourage people, regardless of what model that you want to select, 
we still need you to enroll and we still need you to fill out your um, free and reduced lunch forms, even if you are remote and you've already selected my school remote, you still need to come and fit, go back in and fill out that free and reduced number, I mean free and reduced form so that we have that on record uh, because we'll be coming back to share with you uh, the new guidelines for nutrition services and that is going to be critical for anyone who is to partake in our lunch programming to be able to have that on file. Um, so um, numbers, we'll be able to get you more of those numbers by the, uh, set around September the 20th, a little bit thereafter, we'll know what our n official numbers are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ernestine, I want to ask if you have any questions. Ernestine, are you still with us? Mm. She may have dropped off. Uh, Wendy, could you call and see if we can get her back on? Uh, Mike? Thank you. Um, Stan brought up a good point talking about new money. And one of the things in the deficit that you showed in the last meeting of $10 million, and a lot of that probably comes up with new money, and there's new money and there's one-time money. And I want to make sure that people are understanding that just because we're getting a whole bunch of new money this year, a lot of it is one-time money that we won't get the year after. So the, 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 the minute we exercise the LOB, when we go to 33%, we will have those dollars kind of ongoing, but we'll never be able to add to it. So once we spend it and we embed it in the budget, it's... The, that, that's gone. That option to tap into that is gone. Um, some of the money from last year, when we, you see we ended the year with a $700 million actual expenditures, we actually did, some of those funds ended the year with some cash, which again makes sense because there were several months where we didn't actually have school. Those funds had some one-time dollars that they're able to embed into this year's budget to meet safety concerns and su the supply needs are are just really quite remarkable. If when you start to think about masks and thermometers and just the, the need to have separate supplies for students, things that, that as people, as, as administrators and staff have gotten back into schools, all of these what ifs, as we anticipated, have started to come in. So we're now kind of processing through all of those needs and, 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 and saying, okay, there's budget here for that, there's budget here for that, here's how we're going to, to cover these needs. So we're responding, um, but those, those kind of end of year balances are truly one-time dollars. So once those are gone and we spend those budgets, we're not going to have those into next year. The, the LOB, once we, we, we will have that ongoing, but we can't add to it. So I think that's what you're talking about which is we, we won't, next year's new money will only be the difference in the base aid unless there's some other, you know, some other change to the formula. So right now we can build the, the, that, that LOB $13 million into the budget. Next year when we are looking at or more like $7 million of new money, we're going to have to obviously adjust for that. now are reconnected with Ernestine. Ernestine, do you have any questions on the budget? No, I didn't have any questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mike, did you finish your questions? Well, I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood it. And one of the things that, well, before we took the break, Susan made the comments about the one-time money and one of the biggest things that I want to make sure people are understanding because it's, it's going to get lost in translation, the bus contract ate a bunch of our dollars this year that we didn't, well, we probably saw it coming, but we don't like to say that. And that's one-time money, or that's repetitive money that we're losing and it becomes one-time money. And that ate our budget up severely. We've been lucky with some things and some of these numbers look really good but I want to make sure people are understanding that by the time we get done in July and we're going through the budgets, we could be struggling and to, to build the next year's budget because the base state aid goes down next year, if the, I remember the, right. The, the, base, the base amount per student goes up, but we, uh, we will be experiencing a 500 FTE decrease. So, right. we, so we are kind of getting hit because that enrollment 
um, decline from 19 to 20 was pretty significant. And those are things that we need to keep in mind with our budget, especially with contingency, because it sounds like we have a lot of money in contingency and those types of things. But with $150 million worth of deferred maintenance and on and on and on, and the technology is just going to keep going up and up and up, we've got to be careful that we're not containing that money and not getting to the numbers that make Susan comfortable, because that's important, because really that's that's going to save us in the future from having to cut programs and that's the last thing that I want to do is cut a program so and those programs are probably going to be the ones we don't want to cut athletics fine arts we went through that in 2005 and that was bloody um, luckily we were able to save them but uh, you know that's so we need to be careful about what we're doing with our one-time money and not using it as repetitive money, in my words. Thank you. Stan? Stan, Research District 4. Yeah, and on, that, uh, on the reserves, too, you also got to try to hit that sweet spot because you don't want to have too much reserves where you're taxing people just to sit on their money. Uh, at the same time, you have to be fiscally responsible enough to be prepared for uh, any kind of problems that come up. Uh, Cheryl, if it's appropriate, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, establish 6 p.m. August 24th here at North High as the public hearing and public ad uh, budget adoption for the 2021 budget, if that's appropriate. Okay, I'll we, that. we have a motion by uh, Stan and a second by Mike. And I'm seeing no other comments, so let's begin voting. Ron? Ron Rosales, District 6, yes. Stan Reeser, District 4, yes. Mike Rohde, District 5, yes. Cheryl Logan, at large, yes. Julie Hedrick, District 2, yes. Ben Blankley, District 1, yes. Ernestine? Ernestine Crable, District 3, yes. Okay, you have your authority now, and we will have our budget hearing on the 24th. And if the public wants to come, we will make arrangements for that to happen. The, Although we're not allowing public in any other ways, and they'll have to be outside socially distanced with masks on and, and so on. Correct, and they'll need to make it the, an appointment. Yes, they will need yes. to call in ahead to, to the clerk of the board correct. in order to reserve a spot. That's correct. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.